Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, everyone. This week, uh, Joseph and I are going to talk about the archetype of the orphan, as Lisa is away for a couple of weeks on vacation in Italy. The etymology, origin of the word, it comes from the Greek orphanos, which means bereft the loss of one's primary foundation and support, and a kind of abject uh, loneliness. And I think we know that from all kinds of popular heroes in classical literature and popular uh, film, where the hero is the orphan. And that one side of that is the abject uh, loneliness and isolation of the orphan who has been discarded. And the other side, of course, is all of the grand heroes uh, that we're most of us familiar with. And Joseph and I are going to provide you with a list in just a minute of how many orphans there really are that we're all pretty familiar with. And before we begin with the podcast, I'd like to remind everyone that we are supported by listener donations. We've made an explicit decision not to pursue corporate sponsorship and consequently not have to curate our material. So in order for us to stay spontaneous, in order for us to bring the content which we believe is important into the collective, we need your support. If you'd like to lend a helping hand and make a donation or a monthly donation, please go to our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on Be Our Patron. It helps us fund all the many costs involved with putting out a podcast. And of course, it gives us an opportunity to know you a little better through the Patreon platform. So the orphan archetype, first and foremost, is something that is a psycho spiritual pattern, which I'd like to differentiate from the realities of being a a lived orphan who has lost so much. Those of you that are orphans in our listenership, I mean, our hearts go out to you. And we are talking about how the archetype shows up in mythology, literature, and how it can be a psychological phenomena even in people who have had ostensibly parents in the house. So relative to our cultural fascination, we have crafted modern myths about orphans who have extraordinary capacities. Um, This is Aquaman and Batman, uh, the Green Arrow, Hellboy, Spider-Man, Superman, Supergirl, Cinderella, Harry Potter, Hercules, Daenerys Targaryen in Game of Thrones, and Jon Snow, even the Karate Kid, and for those of us that are older, Tarzan, of course Luke Skywalker, are all part of that mythology of the orphan who begins in adversity and then discovers some extraordinary mission as they're part of the cosmic drama. And here's my list. And what amazes me is, Joseph, you came up with a different list from mine, but what a long list. It really illustrates uh, how prominent the archetype of the orphan is. So here's my list. Uh, Moses, little orphan Annie. Scrooge was basically an orphan. He was outsourced by his father. Oliver Twist, Uh, Romulus and Remus, who were raised by wolves and founded the city of Rome, Frankenstein, Oedipus, Huckleberry Finn, 
and Anne of Green Gables. So there is something in the collective, something universal, that thrums and moves in our dreams and in our imaginations about an extraordinary situation when a child is deprived of both parents. Of course, this is a lived experience, and as we were preparing for the podcast, I was reflecting back on uh, right around to 1989, where there was a tremendous media coverage of Romanian orphanages and this outpouring of distress and impulse to rescue that came out of the United States after this expose was put out and the conditions of the orphanages being so disturbing, so frightening, particularly to American audiences that it mobilized a national effort to intercede. So there is quite a difference between the mythology of the orphan, which we could treat as a literary artifact, versus the realities that certain orphans continue to live in and have lived in. Historically, I imagine that all of these archetypal uh, heroes uh, come from a very uh, terrible and relatively unknown actual human history that I think is really the shadow of, of motherhood, the shadow of parenthood. And it's pretty grim, and we, we don't like to know about it. Uh, there's an anthropologist named Sarah Hurdy who makes you know, a powerful case through some very well-documented research that maternal love and paternal love is not unconditional. And that throughout history and prehistory, mothers, parents had to assess what resources were available to literally raise a child, to feed a child. And that the nature of parenting was pretty contingent on, on a healthy baby and having enough food, having enough resources, having enough social support, etc. And some of the things uh, that, that really illustrate this are some amazing statistics that um, from 1902 to just uh, 20 years, 48% of women in Britain committed to state asylums had committed infanticide. Also in Britain, um, although infanticide was a crime, something like almost 4,000 infants in a five-year period in the mid-1800s uh, died of overlaying, uh, meaning asphyxiation, which was accidental, quote-unquote, smothering of, of, innocent, of infants. And then there was a hospital in Florence um, in the mid-15th century where eventually 5,000 infants a year poured in. So the, the history of, of orphans and children being orphaned is not something just relegated to myth and fairy tale and some of today's superheroes. It's a very real practical matter uh, not so very long ago that without the resources to raise a child, children were allowed to die, abandoned, or deliberately killed. So it speaks to this horrific reality in the relationship to the infant. I also wanted to mention the orphan trains. Uh, that was a movement in the United States. I mean, nobody's hands are clean here. That in the mid-1800s through the early 1900s, approximately 50 years worth, over 250,000 children were put on trains from the East Coast, especially New York City, and delivered to foster families and other people in the Midwest. So as we often do, we're confronted with these several different levels through which we could enter into the imagery of the orphan. There's ancient realities of 
children that are either unwanted or unparented, unclaimed. There's more modern examples like the orphan trains. And there are literary and mythologic examples, and each represent a strata of human experience that we could enter into in the conversation. In some ways, it's difficult to comment on the ancient practices, which by modern standards are so horrific. It's hard for us to understand what the true shape and nature of the psyche was in ancient Greece or ancient Rome. So often we use modern standards, understandably, to look back in ancient times and feel and comment. And, and often, as, we, as I do, feel distraught by some of the things that we hear about. But it is hard to imagine the conditions under which ancient people did live. Well, I also think you know, even in relatively modern times with some of these, you know, astonishing numbers uh, in, you know, relatively recent history here in the Western world, uh, that what we don't want to have to really look at and acknowledge, and I have to say some of this was brand new to me too, is the shadow of motherhood is big and sad. And the reality is that people have to have the resources to raise a child in our modern era of all kinds of books on parenting and what a joy it is. And you outfit the nursery and you go to, you know, some one of these huge uh, emporiums that sell all kinds of baby equipment and furnishings and, and everything else. We really have a hard hard time looking at the shadow of motherhood. And I will let our listeners fit this into the whole debate that's going on now about Dobbs, Roe v. Wade, and right to life uh, versus pro-choice. But here it is, from time immemorial when there were not the resources to raise a child, those children were orphaned or worse. So there are consequences, as there were in the ancient there world. There are consequences, exactly. There are tremendous consequences relative to pregnancies and giving birth to a child in the ancient world. Contraception was not available in any form that we have now. So in the ancient world, having unwanted children could and would place both the infant and perhaps the family with more children than they could feed in dire consequences. And so we may have a cavalier fantasy around the right to surrender certain forms of contraception in the modern world, but that often is advocated without a clear understanding and foresight of the consequences which we have seen since antiquity, and without systems in place to guard against desperate measures. So I think we've probably really established the very real historical underpinnings of how powerful the archetype of the orphan is. And, um, you know, hopefully today there are you know, with modern contraceptive means, there are not so many uh, unwanted children being born. But what we also have now is an appreciation for the developmental, emotional needs of tiny infants and, of course, children and teens. And so we might, you know, make a theoretical extension here about, you know, children that are it don't receive enough in the way of support and attention and nurturing, that there's a kind of orphaning that can take place emotionally. And I think, you know, in times past, you know, children were considered miniature versions of adults. They were sent off to work at age five and uh, in factories and so on. But now we have an appreciation for the fact that infants and children 
are are very very different and have very distinct emotional needs. In the modern era, it re- it really was with Freud's first publication in 1871, and then subsequent publications, that modern theorists began to imagine what the experience of infants might be, and the impact on adult functioning of whether or not those infants achieved various developmental tasks. It's hard for us to imagine a time when we weren't tending to the psyche of the child. But that is actually a very modern concern. That Not so long ago, the assumption was that by the time children could talk and had any agency to help in the home, that they were simply small adults and would be expected to function in many ways like small adults. With Freud's observations and his delving into non-conscious material, he came to understand and bring to light how impactful our childhood is on the development of personality. So whether we feel psychologically abandoned, orphaned, whether we are orphaned by circumstance, orphaned because our mother has untreated postpartum depression, or our fathers leave the home for one reason or another, that these impoverishments of the environment affect infants and children tremendously. Freud did do the initial sort of mapping of of stages of development, and that uh, you know it was all driven by uh, his theory of sexual libido. And uh, so the very first stage was you know newborn infant to one year of age, and that the drive was for sucking, and uh, that then the consequence of inadequate uh, sucking time. <laughs> inadequate attachment was maybe what we would say now, uh, was later on, you know, sort of a oral aggression or, you know, some other kind of oral, unmet oral need that went back to an unremembered time in tiny infancy where that need wasn't met. And then that was succeeded by the anal stage uh, from one to three. And again, if that did not go well, uh, the consequence in adulthood would emerge as uh, authority authority type issues because the child had supposedly not had enough autonomy and uh, consideration for all the toilet training that took place younger. Uh, so each stage, the next one is the phallic stage from three to six, and then latency and the genital stage that was in adulthood all the way till death. But that in a way we're making an equivalent between um, inadequate port understanding, empathy, parenting, uh, and later kind of emotional wounding or orphaning, we might say, of those aspects of a person's personality that were not nurtured, were ignored, or traumatized in some way. When I think about the archetype of the orphan being constellated as a psychological dynamic. I think of the clients I've had over the years who were raised in families where there were 10 or more children in the family, two parents being present, but the sheer number of children, the division of resources, whether that's the amount of time that each child could receive, or literally the material resources that were available left the parents spread so thin or focused on meeting survival needs that the children raised themselves for the most part. And that comes back later in life in the form of chronic anxieties, some attachment struggles, often particularly intense feelings about the family units that they create later in life and unusual fantasies and expectations. There were parents, there were other children all around them, but the lack of 
parental input also can leave us in an orphaned psyche. One of the pieces of work that rises from that can be tremendous ambivalent about attaching to other people. So while the orphaned psychology might long to belong, might long to be held, long to be received, when those opportunities present themselves later in life, the individual can feel remarkably anxious, tentative, or even rebuffing when the opportunity arrives. And one way to think about it is that when we have an unmet longing, as a child it's excruciating to not have that longing met. And whether it's neurologic or psychological, somehow, as infants and children, we have to learn how to put away the unmet longing, or at least put it away from consciousness so that we're not in a state of constant anguish for what we're not getting. And then later in life, when the opportunity to receive it returns, we are very ambivalent about allowing the full measure of the unmet longing to be present in the current relationship. I think you're really heading us into something that is so important, Joseph, of uh, how powerful our emotional needs are. They are as powerful, you know, right after having enough to eat and survival needs are met. But to become adjusted and functioning whole humans, we need the nurturing, uh, the attention, attachment. And um, this was something, this was research that was began by a man named John Bowlby and has been followed up by a number of, of other people who all talk about stages of, of development and how important the emotional needs are. You know, Eric Erickson talks about trust versus mistrust, which I think you were uh, really referring to um, in the infant years and then um, autonomy versus shame and doubt for toddlers. So this was starting to be lifted up by some of these people who had all kinds of child assessment tests and observations. So it wasn't just their ideas, it was really founded on on good data. And that um, it's now been categorized as attachment patterns of the secure attached infant has caregivers that are attuned and and resonant and trustworthy, hence Erickson's trust versus mistrust in the first year. But if caregivers are distant or absent or just not not attentive, babies can be insecure uh, in a way where they just avoid contact. They avoid feeling, which is what you were talking about a little bit. And other kinds of insecure attachments result in other kinds of adult relationship dynamics. And so all of this really does, um, I think, underscore our, our thesis here today that there are psychological dimensions to the archetype of the orphan and that a very heavy price is paid for serious kinds of neglect or indifference. The guy, I want to give, give a little shout out to this um, Scottish uh, psychoanalyst named Ronald Fairbairn, uh, who was born in 1889 and, and lived until the mid-1960s. And he's really the founder of what we call object relations, which is early, early development and emotional uh, patterning. And he says, the child who is so unfortunate to be born in a family where the parents are absent, indifferent, or abusive, is going to experience and internalize a huge number of bad object interactions, end quote. But what's a bad object? Well, a bad object is one in which the parent or guardian that the child looks to for love and help and guidance fails the child again and again. Uh, So this is today's iteration in many a family where there's at least enough food 
of what internal psychological and emotional orphaning uh, can create. Unhappy, anxious, and many other things, <laughs> kinds of problems in adulthood. And this understanding of child development is still proceeding in leaps and bounds what we know about neurologic development and what the child is or is not exposed to, how it quite literally changes how the brain functions. Now, there is some hope in the studies around neuroplasticity that some things that did not happen could be accommodated somewhat later in life. But even I, I think back to stories that some of my elderly clients have told me over the years. I'm thinking about one person who was fostered, and this was in the mid-1930s. It was not uncommon if a family felt that they could not tend to a child for one reason or another, that the foster system would take a child in, having been surrendered by the parents. The child might be collected at some time later. So one of my uh, analysands had had this experience. There was a lot of difficulty in the home, inadequate resources, and he was placed into foster care. At that time in the 30s, even though Freud's developmental system was in place, there still was very little understanding about attachment, and often attachment and loyalty were confused at that time. So often what foster parents were admonished to do is to not show kindness to the foster children lest they become attached and expect to stay. So what would happen is that a kid would be put into the home, the foster parents were encouraged to be aloof and rather stern, and they would only be allowed to be there for about one or one and a half years before they would be moved for fear that they would become attached. And then being separated would somehow both be traumatized, but also that the loyalty to the biological parent would somehow be violated. This was, of course, horribly wrongheaded, and it, it produced a generation of deeply wounded people. But this sensitivity to the needs of the child, once again, is still a quite modern phenomena. Now, stepping away from the lived suffering of untended children, Jung was interested in the universal archetype of the orphan and how that functions in the archaic strata of the psyche. One of the places where Jung really could delve into this was that when he was building his second home called Bollingen, uh, he asked for a cornerstone to be delivered, and the stone that was delivered was the wrong size. Uh, so they were, they were going to take it back. And Jung said, no, that's my stone. I must have it. For I had seen it once that it suited me perfectly, and I wanted to do something with it. Only I did not yet know what. So he, here is Jung seized by this stone. But more than that, uh, he's seized by what to do with it. Here is this orphan stone, and that's what he called it, the orphan stone. And he had a, a verse that uh, was a Latin verse by an alchemist. Here stands the mean, uncomely stone. Tis very cheap in price. The more it is despised by fools, the more loved by the wise. And so he started to carve the stone. And there, there are images of it that you can find online. There, there's a little man on it, and there are there is some verse. And on the third face of this stone, uh, the one that uh, faced the lake, he says, I let the stone itself speak as it were in a Latin inscription. And this is the translation. I am an orphan alone. Nevertheless, I am found everywhere. I am one, but opposed to myself. 
I am youth and old man at one and the same time. I have known neither father nor mother, because I have had to be fetched out of the deep like a fish, or fell like a white stone from heaven. In woods and mountains I roam, but I am hidden in the innermost soul of man. I am mortal for everyone, yet I am not touched by the cycle of the eons. So I think that speaks to the inner place in all of us that is the orphan alone, young and old, but also with the unique promise that uh, circling back to all the heroes that we referenced of special destiny that I think ties right in to Jung's concept of individuation that we must become our own unique selves and in a way that makes us orphans. And I think that's what a lot of these heroes, you know, portray on in in literature and on the screen is you come from these uncared for, isolated beginnings and but your destiny lies before you, uh, imaged as heroic. When I was taking in the phrase that you had written about Jung. And I was thinking about how the unrecognized self, capital S, can be seen as a kind of orphan in as much as it is not in relationship to the ego. That part of the recognition of the secret value in things that are not fully valued has to do with having a sense of the universal, the archetypal, having a sense of the inherent wholeness that is in relationship to ourselves, but also its potential to be recognized. And so when we, or when Jung writes about this universal field of energy, that he is talking about the recognition and the discovery of the self. And he makes that distinction between the physical alchemists who literally were trying to turn lead into gold, trying to take something that's not valuable and is very common and perhaps nothing worth keeping. And through some transformative process, it becomes highly valuable, literally gold in the efforts of the physical alchemists, but something that becomes incredibly valuable, personal, and vibrant in the personality. So in one way, we could also imagine using Kalshad's uh, paradigm around trauma and the inner world, that when we are living through the challenges of our childhood and we come to irreconcilably painful moments, that something in the psyche will cut off a part of the soul and orphan it, so to speak, in the psyche, surrounding it by fantasy material and defenses, much the way Rapunzel is orphaned and kept in a tower, protected by a witch that provides all that she needs ostensibly, but will not allow her to go into the world and live. And so we ourselves have multiple internal orphans capacities, memories, aspects of our own potential that are wandering in the unconscious in a kind of haze, waiting to be reclaimed in the, the many ways that one might do that. I think that's uh, really such a good point. And the image of Rapunzel is especially vivid as it uh, really depicts uh, what Donald Kalshed uh, building, of course, on the work of earlier psychologists, uh, depicted as the protector-persecutor complex, that the witch protected Rapunzel and also persecuted her. <laughs> so he kept her safe in a certain literal sense, but uh, not able to go out in the world. And so what what has happened, I think, with the archetype of the orphan is that in the last, I would say, 50, maybe 75 years, we have really made great headway on trauma theory. 
especially developmental trauma or emotional trauma, relational trauma, the kind that is, it's not vividly abusive, but it is a constant uh, indifference or lack or neglect uh, of some part of the child. And that we really do have the hope, uh, like Rapunzel, who finally busts out of her tower, we really do have the hope for what's called earned security. So our, our missions, uh, should we choose to accept them, are to rescue our own inner orphans in order to become whole, in order to be all that we were innately born to be. And this process of recognizing the parts of ourselves that have been orphaned often shows up in projections, that as we are looking out into the world, there are certain scenes, experiences, behaviors in other people that ignite enormously intense feelings inside of us. And as we become curious about the disposition proportionate amount of feeling that we have as a reaction to something, if we understood that that's, it's like a flare that's being shot up in the air by our orphaned parts, trying to get our attention to something, which at first we might want to flee from because it's disturbing. But if we could convince ourselves that there's something lost that we have to claim inside of ourselves that is responding to an opportunity, we could change how we see the things in our lives that upset us, cause us to shake our fists. I'm, I'm finding myself thinking about one of your examples, uh, Deb, Little Orphan Annie, hmm. and uh, the musical that came out of that, and the, the lamenting songs that the orphans sing. And in that particular story, we depict the orphan as relentlessly cheerful and optimistic and full of hope. And in the beginning songs of the musical, she talks about the fantasy of belonging belonging to someone, belonging to magical parents that exist somewhere in the world, and that if only the two, the orphan and the parents, could find each other again, that the belonging and the restoration would constellate all the goodness that one is seeking. Now that drive to belong is something that is very much alive in many people's psyches. I've had friends and analysands who had fantasies that the parents that they were raised with were not their real parents, that they must have belonged to someone else and through some fate wound up in the hands of their biological parents. This often brings forward tremendous fantasies of the parents that are not there, but they wish were there. And the intensity of that compensatory fantasy can continue well into adulthood and set people on a search through genealogy and the various websites like 23andMe that allow them to get their genetic mapping done, to find the ones they belong to. And that kind of longing uh, can start us out on our individuation journey, uh, that we may you know, really frame it and think of it as finding specific people. Uh, and that's part of many a story and myth. And it takes us on that journey of finding our own inner parent and then our own inner belonging to ourselves. Because the positive side of the archetype of the orphan is that although that child has been uh, discarded, 
that is also the sacred, which is what all these stories point to, that there's something sacred, something special, there's potential, there's a light inside that can never be extinguished. And that often the orphans are depicted as, as the light bearers, that they have special gifts and that they will shine and, and develop because in some way they are truly blessed. And sometimes orphans are native, aided by, by nature. You know, like Romulus and Remus were raised by wolves, a fairy godmother, various kinds of uh, animals. So that uh, always the sacred side is the goal of, of becoming whole, the goal of shining, the goal of uh, being a unique, whole self, despite adversity. It's, there's a hopeful side to it uh, that I think has been borne out enough <laughs> so that there is obviously some real, real truth to that too that we can survive and, and then we can thrive despite adversity. So I'm thinking about the work that emerged again in the 80s and 90s with John Bradshaw, who really brought forward the idea of inner child work, writing letters to the inner child with the right hand, responding with the left hand, imagining what the inner child might need, and trying to bring the inner orphan forward and the needs of the inner orphan. And just as you had said, Deb, that we can become the parents that we did not have, that we can mother and father ourselves in ways that we wish we had been. Once the ego is awake, has a sense of its resources and who it is, there are things that we absolutely can bring forward. Another iteration of this, I think, is in Internal Family Systems, IFS, which is a trending psychotherapy that brings forward the idea of inner figures, seeing them as a family unit, and what do these various inner figures require in order to have an experience of wholeness and peace. Their methods are different from Bradshaw's, but it still goes to this idea of bringing those lost or orphaned parts out of the unconscious. Coming full circle to our list of heroes who were orphans, that there is a relationship to the hero and the orphan archetypally, that out of the suffering and the pain of the orphan, out of the disconnection and longing that has not been met, that the orphan, when they reach an age of agency, capacity, do wake up to the need, the unmet need, which then propels them out of their circumstances and onto some kind of a journey, whether that's the journey to create a career or to find friends to replace loved ones who were perhaps never there. But we gravitate to these heroes with orphan beginnings because something in us needs to know that we can overcome massive adversity, which is true for all of us in a greater or lesser degree. I, I think that's right, right on, and that... Uh, the modern heroes that we see, like, like Luke Skywalker and Clark Kent and my personal favorite, Peter Parker, who was Spider-Man, really build on something that is innate in the psyche, the human psyche, all across cultures and throughout time, uh, which is that hope, the possibility, the potential that you too can overcome adversity, you can, and that there's hope, and that nothing really can quench uh, the inviolable spark and spirit of the human soul. And I think that is a, a, a wonderful message, and it's true. <laughs> and, and we need that archetypal story. 
Yes. That in our darkest times, in our despair, when we feel there is nowhere to turn, or that we can never find our way out of the labyrinth of our suffering, that there is a universal pattern somewhere in the psyche that gives us a sense of hope, gives us a sense that we have a hidden capacity, a magical power, and that the magical power really is the self. So if we imagine this in terms of the inner landscape that Jung imagined for us, the self is this power source that lives at the center of the planet of you, and that this life force is naturally trying to rise to the surface and reach you, the ego, the waking personality walking around on the landscape above. And when that does reach us here on the landscape, we have enough vitality to go back to school and get what we need, to fight for what we think is right, to get up early in the morning, to stay calm and focused when difficult things happen, that there's a place that that determination comes from. And that as that energy rises up from the center of the planet of us, that it hits other kinds of problematic images that we call complexes. And then the energy gets discharged sideways, gets discharged into this complex or that complex or the father complex or the authority complex or memories of our various sufferings. And so the hero's journey in a very personal way is to be able first to take a sense of radical self-responsibility that you are the only one who's going to get you out of this conundrum, get you out of your suffering. And that the challenges that you are sure exist around you actually exist inside you. And as we turn inside, and dream work is so important for this, we begin to discover the inner figures that were created from our early childhood difficulties. And those are the dragons that we have to slay. Those are the the villains that show up, you know, challenging Superman and Peter Parker, that they are in us and require something of us. And one piece is direct, consistent engagement with our inner villains. And in that engagement, the heroic ego over time develops a sense of identity develops a sense of power. And on that optimistic note, uh, let's turn to a dream. Before we do that, let me invite you to go to our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on Dream School. Our dream analysis segment of the podcast is always especially Uh, popular people write to us and of course um, people submit their dreams and we value that uh, very much so take a look on our website at dream school there's some beautiful images and some descriptions of our 12 part uh, self-paced course online that i think might interest you and at least it's worth a look And there are interactive opportunities uh, with Lisa, Joseph, and me every month so we can get to know you a bit and you get to know us. Uh, There are interactive possibilities on the forum. You can join a study group. You can join a dream group. So hop on over. Take a look. Our dreamer this week is a woman. She's 37. And she is a psychotherapist, um, and she's continuing her her studies and dipping into some depth psychology. Here's the dream. I'm in an orphanage. There are many other children with me as well. I am the oldest of the group. I feel responsible for the group's well-being since I am the oldest. 
We're together in a room with wooden floors and ceiling. Suddenly, an evil man and a strange man appears out of nowhere. He is our master. He tear gasses us. We cannot see or breathe. The gas makes what is in our pockets fall out. Knickknacks, little toys, memorabilia, coins, little notes on crumpled paper. What is in our pockets does not have high monetary value, but it is meaningful to us since we are orphans and have nothing else. The evil master collects our belongings that are falling to the floor from the gas. He makes them his. I ache with sadness to lose what was the only remnant of our identity. Suddenly, Komitas, he is a famous Armenian composer and ethnographer, breaks through the door of the room we are in. He charges aggressively toward the evil master. Komitas has a gun. He points and tries to shoot at the evil master. He misses. Komitas turns toward me. His eyes are full of rage but feels vacant and maniacal. I feel Komitas is in a psychotic state. Komitas takes my hand and places it on the gun. He's standing behind me. I am holding the gun and he is holding my hands. He points the gun at the evil master. He asks me, is this the man, the one I need to kill? I say yes, in agreement. I know this is what needs to happen. I am sad and afraid. For context, the dreamer says, My grandfather is an Armenian genocide survivor. He was fatherless. I have been on a slow but painful journey of understanding my own emotional orphanhood because of this. The main feelings in the dream were sadness, fear, loneliness, and emptiness. And for additional context, she says, Komitas was an orphaned composer in the early 1900s. He's responsible for composing Armenian liturgical music, all of it, and transcribing village music. At the cusp of the Armenian genocide, he was one of the first, since he was well known at the time, people to get sent into a death march by order of the Turkish government. He was miraculously saved and relocated to France, where he was so traumatized, he became mentally ill and died. Freud offered his support at the time of his madness, but Komitas refused. I should also note that Komitas was a celibate priest and was rescued by the church. So the historic lens is very powerful, and it would be easy to tumble into it as we interpret the dream. But our discipline with Jung's help, is to maintain a symbolic attitude, which is not to deride any of the political and circumstantial truths, but to figure out what it means for this to be happening in the psychic landscape. So I'm struck in the beginning that there is an orphanage with many children, and that because she is the oldest, she has a sense of responsibility. And yet she herself seems like is still a child in the dream, although we don't kind of get a sense of whether she feels like she is a child. So we're in that role of the parentified child. And we're also in a real family kind of constellation, which, which does go to the context that she provides of the transgenerational uh, emotional link to the Armenian genocide that her grandfather survived, and also the historical figure who's in her dream of, of Komitas, who was so sadly uh, persecuted and who then uh, became mentally ill and could not, could not surmount the, tr the trauma that he experienced. So here's her dream family. She's the oldest child who often in families uh, has that sort of super responsible role. And then we have the evil man uh, who tear gasses people and takes uh, all their precious uh, little contents that they have from their, from their pockets. But the interaction between the evil master and, and Komitas 
uh, who is also aggressive and violent and has, has the gun. His eyes are full of rage, uh, and he feels vacant and maniacal. So here are these two dark characters, and then Komitas places the gun in her hands and says, is this the one I need to kill? And the dream ego says yes. Uh, so I'm wondering about the dream ego's interaction with these two animus figures, evil man and Komitas, and the power that both of them have. I'm thinking about the, the evil man who is the one who falls, who triggers the children to lose their identities, that whatever the tear gas in is, mm -hmm. that it has this dissociating capacity to it. And what little I know about tear gas is it does have an overwhelming effect on the individual that mm -hmm. they can't breathe correctly, they can't think, and they're put into a kind of desperate survival moment where worrying about fighting or strategizing you know, is, is not even possible. So it's a way of stunning the other person, ostensibly without fully killing them. So we have a psychic environment now where the orphaned parts of her are under the care of, ostensibly, an inner animus figure, as you had said, that keeps shattering, scattering their memories and their sense of identity. That would be a survival mechanism for a young child, that these inner figures that fragment parts of our memories and identity, because at the moment in childhood, it's too excruciating to hold it intact. But later in life, we can dare to dream about these factors because we are strong enough to reclaim the lost belongings and tolerate the tears, the rage, the various affects without being destroyed by them. I'm wondering what might be going on um, in the dreamer's current life situation that feels um, as annihilating as this. Remembering that an orphan is utterly desolate and utterly uh, alone and bereft and without resources. So the first thing, the evil man takes away their, you know, what little they have as identity, the tear gas. And th these are my talismans, uh, the special little crumpled note that I had from my you know, from somebody I cared about. So there's this erasure of, of everything. But Komitas feels vacant and maniacal, and the dream ego feels that he is in a psychotic state. And, and the real world, Komitas, um, you know, may well have been after all his trials and, and tribulations and trauma. But that the only possible solution to this scenario is for the dream ego to give permission to Komitas to kill the evil man. And what do we make of this kind of a, a, an inner world homicide? Uh, that she would be, you know, if we dreamt the dream on, that she's now left without the evil man who tear gases, but there is another man who is in a psychotic state who has a gun. That these are uh, such radically uh, shadowy uh, inner figures that we call animus figures, meaning you know that they're not uh, people that she has a real world relationship with. They're not really human. They're they're storied figures. They're ar they have archetypal power, and that where is that uh, in her that she's left without a positive? alliance, the best she can do in the dream is to authorize the killing of the evil man. So it feels like some kind of inner attacking, a doubling of, of an inner attacking figure, uh, where the attack is directed is, is different, 
but both are attacking figures. So we might surmise that there is a tremendous amount of unconscious aggression that is perhaps targeted against the self instead of harnessed to something that would be more life, more helpful to the life. I, I still feel a certain amount of hope in the raging Komitas who comes in. I think of the Irish hero Cúculain, who would go into these rages, and if he is positioned correctly, he would go into a mindless rage and be an unstoppable warrior and defeat the enemy. Then he would come out of the rage ostensibly and return to his humanity. There is a story where the villagers cannot contain his rage, and they need to send an anima figure, a, a gentle female figure to him, to call him back from his, his madness of rage. The Berserkers is another story which comes out of the Nordic mythology of being possessed by a supernatural ability to fight. So I think this is also a story about her ambivalence around accessing her own rage, that when we are deprived of adequate help in childhood, we can get the signal that our normal, intense experiences as infants and children is somehow dangerous and cannot be mediated, can't be spoken about. Now, of course, being a rageful adult can be a little more impressive or a little scary because it can feel so primal. I mean, we can be enraged the way a child is enraged, you know, but we can't be contained the way a child could be contained either, so it can feel pretty scary. But it does seem like the Komitas figure is trying to put the orphaned ego in relationship both to agency, that you have a gun, and to rage, which somehow has been lost in the childhood trauma. And I respect that the ego is conscious of the magnitude of this, that she doesn't just become possessed by Komitas's rage, that she's holding the gun and she's questioning, thinking about all of this, which is that mediating influence of the adult ego. I think I also want to add, uh, you know, lest this seems so, so very, very heavy, um, not that it isn't necessarily, but when I was in training uh, w with you and Lisa, I had this absolutely god-awful dream in which I, the dream ego, uh, killed a man-slash-creature who needed to be killed. You know, just as in this dream, the evil man, we might say, needs to be killed. I, I was so shocked by that dream. You know, here I am, <laughs> studying Jung. I'm on my way to being a Jungian analyst, or so I fervently hoped. And how could I have this kind of a dream? What did it mean about, you know, was there some you know, incredible, dark, awful thing? But really what it was was about, I believe, negative animus, and it did have to do, just as you said, with aggression and uh, rage, but but also with a kind of uh, strength and autonomy. And of course, I, I was, as we all were, in analysis, and I <laughs> went racing into my analyst the next week and said, what about this? But it was something that I was ready to have emerge in the psyche. And here our dreamer for this week is in a PhD program and doing depth psychology. So I'm wondering if this is something where the psyche is saying, it's time for you to encounter this. And uh, that it's also sort of a vote of confidence, <laughs> as it were, in, in her ability to metabolize uh, something from the past. Absolutely. I think the dream, as distressing as it is, is hopeful. I'm also 
struck by the word tear gas. Mm. There is something in the grieving Mm -hmm. and raging process. It's hard to to make uh, too much of a predictive process here, but sometimes our tears and grief can mask other valences underneath it. And so suspending the tear gas or the, the crippling grief and allowing a kind of rage to come forward could be a process that is unfolding that, as you said, Deb, could require a sensitive holding by another clinician mm-hmm. to provide support and frame it in a way that it can be harnessed to something useful. Often in trauma work, the rage is often the cover for the grief. One pushes the rage aside to find the grief. But here the sequencing is different. So it may be that the tears around all of this have a certain kind of stunning effect, a certain kind of fragmenting effect, and that the thing that consolidates is the anger, which is often true for folks. That getting angry kind of tones us up, focuses us. Provides agency. Exactly. There's some power there. And, and that could be useful. And when she says the main feelings in the dream are sadness, fear, loneliness, and emptiness, well, what I don't hear is anger. Mm-hmm. Not on the ego side. So all the anger is being held by the mm-hmm. fierce comitas yeah. figure. No, I think that's, that's right. That's right on. The anger is comitas, not the dream ego. All the dream ego has to do is say, yeah, go ahead, shoot him. She doesn't do the deed of the shooting herself. Uh, She simply directs somebody else to do it. She says, I'm holding the gun, and he's holding her hands. So what's interesting is there's a little transference Mm -hmm. of agency from comitas to the ego, gesturally, in as much as she's holding the gun. But she's frozen in that moment. It's a cliffhanger. You know. But then he asks me, is this the man, the one I need to kill? So her hands, you're right, her hands are definitely on the weapon, but she's not really the one doing it. No. But, no, but of I course she she's... is. <laughs> exactly. And that she's ready for the, the veil of tears to stop and the fragmenting to stop and to come out of the orphanage, even though it's familiar to be in the orphanage, and even though the authority figures somehow seem to be taking care of the inner orphans, there comes a time where it just needs to stop. We have to go beyond it in order to grow, in order to heal. So while there's a lot of disturbed feeling in the dream, I tend to favor the idea that every dream is some form of medicine. Sometimes it's harsh medicine, the way chemotherapy is very hard on people, but it's trying to make something better in the psychic environment, even if it's frightening and confusing at the moment. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.